Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Henri Bergson's essay, Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic. Um, so this is a philosophy text about the nature of comedy. Um, and this is originally published in 1911, which is going to be important for, for the way that I uh, am interpreting and responding to Bergson's argument. So basically what Bergson sets out to do in this essay is to figure out what makes something comic or what makes something laughable. And essentially, he, he comes up, you can condense it down to really two major arguments that he makes. One is the laughable element in both cases so he's talking about two specific cases, but this is the general rule. Uh, the laughable element in both cases consists of a certain mechanical inelasticity, just where one would expect to find the wide awake adaptability and the living pliableness of a human being. Um, he states this in another way a little bit later on, presenting this as a law. Aha. Uh -huh. We laugh every time a person gives us the impression of being a thing. So what does he mean by this? Well, essentially, Bergson argues that comedy arises when a human being, because he claims that, that human beings are the only source of the comic, um, and even when we laugh at, say, a cute kitten video on YouTube or something like this, um, we're laughing because we identify in that cat, in that cat's behavior, something human-like. Um, so Bergson says humans are the only source of comedy, which may or may not be true. Um, but what he argues is that comedy arises when you have something, some behavior, some activity that is that gives the sense of being mechanized, gives the sense of being automatic, um, rather than being um, sort of live, natural, graceful, etc., etc. So uh, he gives the example of, say, someone stumbling because they don't notice a, a, an obstacle in their way or something like this. Um, America's Funniest Home Videos. Any of the video, any of any of the videos in a in a thing like Amer like America's Funniest Home Videos, where someone trips over something, the Marx Brothers, the Three Stooges, um, these sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> so this is his central argument. Ultimately, is that comedy is comedy arises from what appears to be inelastic activity and absent-mindedness is a big component of this form absent-mindedness is one of his big sort of go-to examples of a thing that's funny um, a, a source of comedy because a person behaves as though uh, they behaves as though the physical world either doesn't exist or doesn't impact them um, and yet they encounter the the various stumbling blocks of reality around them. So Bergson breaks this down um, and he looks at different elements. He looks at, at ways of building comic plots. He looks at the comic character, etc., etc. Um, and when he's looking at ways of building comedy, he gives us three major things. Repetition, inversion, and reciprocal interference of series. So repetition is probably the easiest to grasp um, when you keep sort of going around in circles. Uh, you think about like a Tom and Jerry cartoon or a uh, Roadrunner cartoon or something like this. These sort of continuous attempts like when Wiley e. Coyote continues to buy the Acme rocket and tries to use that to, to 
be as fast as the Roadrunner and continually slams into a cliff or whatever it is. This sort of repetition arises in part from the absurdity of it. You can also do this on the level of language, like a lot of jokes, a lot of wordplay depends on repetition. Inversion is the um, reversal of expectations. So you take what we would normally expect to occur and you give us the opposite. So uh, the thief who is stolen from, um, whatever it is. This is a, a traditionally comic character. Um, this also works on the level of language. Wit a lot of times uh, uses uh, inversion. Um, so we think about comedies of manners, for instance, Oscar Wilde and people like this, very much built on inversion and repetition as ways of, of creating the wit. Reciprocal interference of series is the least obvious, and in some ways, I think, in some ways, it's the one that makes the least sense to me as a technique. What Bergson says is that perhaps it might be defined as follows. A situation is invariably comic when it belongs simultaneously to two altogether independent series of events and is capable of being interpreted in two entirely different meanings at the same time. Now, I'm, I'm not... He, his examples aren't super clear, and they don't strike me as being incredibly funny, but the way that I'm sort of thinking about this one, or the way that, that it makes sense to me, is if you think about something like a Shakespeare comedy, where you have two sort of tracks. You have a high plot and a low plot. Um, so the high plot is the main set of characters, protagonist, antagonist, etc., etc. But then you have the low plot, which are secondary characters who are less important, um, who are often more overtly comical. Um, so you think about in Twelfth Night, for instance, you have the main plot with um, Duke Orsino, I think his name's Orsino. It's been several years since I read the play, probably about four or five years since I read the play. Uh, but you've got the Duke, you've got Olivia, you've got Viola. Then you've got the the minor plot with Sir Toby Belch, Sir Andrew Aguecheek, Maria, um, and Malvolio. They work in tandem, they work parallel to one another and because they deal with similar themes, but in different ways, almost in some ways opposite ways, um, you have you have a source of comedy arising from that tension. So each of these for Bergson represents a form of automatism, um, a form of human beings acting as though they are mechanical and what he what he argues in terms of why laughter exists why we direct laughter at the absent-minded at the person who stumbles on a crowded sidewalk whatever it is he argues that laughter has a social function and that there in this sense it therefore only exists collectively and that's an interesting point because it seems intuitively like that's wrong. Like you can laugh at something by yourself, but what Bergson I think would argue is that even when you laugh at something by yourself, you implicitly laugh with society. You laugh out of social expectations that the thing that has just occurred is worthy of mockery, worthy of correction, perhaps. Um, and so even when you are, for instance, um, I don't know if you're scrolling through Facebook and you see a funny meme, or if you're watching a TV show by yourself, or uh, reading a book, uh, whatever it is, and something strikes you as funny, you're still, according to Bergson, or I think Bergson would say, uh, you are still laughing with people because you because your your reaction your experience of humor 
is still grounded in a social construct of normal, proper, lived behavior. So that's essentially what Bergson says is the social function of laughter, is a kind of corrective. It's a way for society to punish the absent-minded person, punish the careless person, punish the uh, overly mechanized person, whatever it is, and therefore bring that person back into the sphere of properly oriented social activity. Now, I have a big critique of Bergson's essay here. Mainly that's the ways in which he presents his argument as absolutes. He says this is a law of the comic, or in every instance we find X thing. The problem is there are situations in which a person may appear mechanized, a person may appear automatic, that aren't funny. Uh, one of the big ones I would, I would point to is something like um, George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Zombies are a sort of mechanized humanity. And while there are funny zombie movies, like Shaun of the Dead, for instance, Generally speaking, zombie movies are not a source of comedy. They tend to be horror, because the zombie is an uncanny figure. And I talked about this in my video about Night of the Living Dead. The zombie is an uncanny figure because it represents a kind of humanity, but a humanity that isn't quite right. There's there's something, there's a distinction that makes that figure threatening. So, in this sense, Berg's, and I mean, the other big example I would think about would be like the Terminator films. Um, the Terminator, at least the, in the, okay, in Terminator 2, we get some humor from, from Arnold. Um, but in the original Terminator film, the mechanized human is not a source of comedy. He is an uncanny source of horror. So in this sense, Bergson has, has missed something important out of his theory. He's missed out a major component, a major alternative explanation for what mechanized, automatized, inelastic humanity may do. It may not be comic. And Bergson doesn't really deal with that possibility. He has a very distinct idea, and he asserts that it's always correct. Which, philosophically, rhetorically, is kind of a bad strategy.